Um, next up is uh, Meg Whitaker, and um, I'll just tell you, I remember the moment I met Meg Whitaker. It was. Oh. Do you remember, remember that moment? It too. Yeah. <laughs> when was that, Meg? That's right. It was five years ago at the AA Commons meeting, and here's why. <laughs> the Alternatives Assessment Commons meeting in Boston was the first time I met oh, yeah, Meg. That's right. Uh, she's with Tox Services. She's a toxicologist, but so much more than that. She's like the toxicologist, toxicologist. And, uh, but I'd heard about her long before because if you're interested in prevention, if you're interested in the methods of doing alternatives assessment, then you heard about Meg Whitaker. And when I met her at the meeting, she was even more impressive than what I had read and seen before. Um, she does a lot of work at Tox Services for many different kinds of organizations, business, government, uh, works with the uh, kind of research community as well. She's, and she does things like chemical hazard assessment, product specific, toxicological assessment. But she's like, Anne had that S curve showing how things get adopted. And at the end, she said, there's these accelerators that really drive it. And that's what Meg is, an accelerator. So, and by the way, please accelerate because you only have 10 minutes. <laughs> This is tough. It's like a drinking game. How fast can you get through? <laughs> I liked what uh, Tim said, and I tend to work not just about me, but uh, I liked what Tim said about what companies have to have, the values. And I spend a lot of time, I work for NGOs and the government as well, US EPA, Safer Choice, but I work for a lot of companies who accelerate. Um, and I work with people within certain companies who aren't yet seeing the light and start a movement within. And uh, a funny story, and I know we gotta go fast, but this is kind of a way to let you know how you can make change. So I often get flown into companies, or my staff do, and we get placed to do special projects. So let's say a brand new electronic is gonna come out, and 400, people, 400 million people will be wearing it. We're often involved in going through all the chemicals. So what we'll do is we, kind of get in there and we'll start putting books in, like uh, Mary O'Brien's book, and we'll build little libraries and corporations around America. Um, Materials Matter by Ken Geyser. These people don't know what Tory is. They have no idea Mary O'Brien is one of the starters of the AA movement. And it's kind of funny because we leave and sow our little seeds as new people come on board. It's non-judgmental. It's kind of like the Gideon, you know? If you want to read it, cool. If not, you just don't look in the hotel room. But um, because I'm known as being science will always win, I think playing fair will always win. I won't work for companies that don't play like that. But particularly with all of you who are uh, a lot younger than I am, there's a place for you to make a big difference. And that's what I decided to do, and I've been able to do it. Some companies will think we're crazy and they don't want to have anything to do with us. But most of the very large companies that are doing good things are using all of the tools that I use. Um, and it is true that even businesses, whether they're people or not, they do care and they want credible information and data to make decisions. So most companies out there, even some of the ones that are you know, not quite as illuminated, don't want to make bad decisions. It's challenging to find out to the cast number level what's in a material, what's in a new strap in an eye watch, what's in uh, a laptop, what's in a base, let's say uh, on a cosmetic. Often they don't know. So I spend a lot of time trying to get the data out. Sometimes it can't be publicized from suppliers. And how do you find out how to make decisions so that the environment and public health, they're equally balanced in terms of protecting them. So you've heard about BPA, regrettable substitutions. I spent a lot of time trying to move to better ones. Of course, it would be great if you didn't have to line cans with a lining, for example, but for certain foods that are super acidic, there's still a need for it. So here's a good example of a polymer that Valspar has been working on, and her name is Teresa McGrath, who uh, was at NSF and is one of the great, uh, uh, she wasn't a founder of Green Screen, she's like I am, she's been very involved in the Green Screen movement. So we're using a lot of the tools to try and move away from things that we know um, are endocrine active. They get a little bit better with BPS, it's still endocrine active, and we're trying to move to safer molecules. So companies I work with have lots of tools. I'm pretty much in the toxicology arena, so I try and minimize hazards, and if that's not possible, I try and minimize risks. 
well, we're just one little part of it. A lot of people, particularly the cosmetics industry, they're still in the risk sector. They're gonna try and say, is it safe enough? I spend a lot of time trying to avoid the hazard to begin with so we don't have to worry about the exposure assessment. And then life cycle assessment is another really big movement um, that doesn't do a great job, in my opinion, looking at toxics. So I play in that little uh, balloon up there. And a lot of the tools do take a lot of training. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a tox degree to perform a green screen, but you have to have some training. And I'll show you quickly at a slide how you can get some of that training. But businesses are using, by law in America, they have to technically have a safety data sheet to follow the hazard communication standard if they're making especially a wet chemical formulation, but they're very crude. So it'll tell you maybe you won't get cancer, but it won't tell you whether you're gonna have uh, some kind of skin sensitization reaction. So companies now in America are getting very good though at going all the way up and trying to use something called green screen for safer chemicals that'll look at 18 separate hazard endpoints for human health and environmental fate and toxicity. So this is a big table I spend a lot of my time in. Under a green screen, we look at 18 separate hazard endpoints, and you can complete a green screen in three steps. It just takes about 20 hours if you're a skilled <laughs> toxicologist. Hey. Um, but the beauty of it is we spend a lot of time working with companies so that, particularly in America a few years ago, they didn't care about environmental toxin fate. Is it flammable? Is it reactive? Who cares for workers? So that solvent's flammable, just keep it stored and we won't be in the plant when it catches fire. So we spend a lot of time trying to educate them on it and to talk about in an open way, well, what are the trade-offs? Maybe it is a non-flammable solvent, but maybe it's super irritating to the skin and eyes. Well, then you make a decision to say you'll use that, but only if you're gonna use certain exposure prevention measures. This tool is great because it gets someone at least on a way to start taking action. What scares so many people is that they get overwhelmed with data. They don't know how to make decisions. It's overwhelming. So I'm gonna kill, it's aquatically toxic, but it's not carcinogenic and it's not flammable. What do we do? How do we make decisions? How do we, how do we figure out trade-offs? Um, this system does a great job doing that. Here's a quick little example of a green screen uh, we put together uh, for a company that was looking for an alternative to perfluorinated uh, water repellents. And this is just a simple wax. And it works fairly, uh, fairly well. And it got something called a, a green screen benchmark three score. And what green screen does is it translates those special little combinations of hazard scores for those 18 endpoints. Going from low, for certain endpoints, it's very high or very low. But what it does is it's an algorithm. So most people don't want to understand permutations of 18 hazard endpoints, um, and especially on a Friday afternoon or something. But what we do is there's a certain combination and it's based on GHS, OECD, and EPA endpoints. And we come up with an overall simple benchmark score. Certain companies like Levi's, and I'm a big, I work for them a lot, will say, we don't want benchmark ones. Those are PBTs, for example, persistent bioaccumulative toxicants. They can say to their suppliers, no benchmark ones. Under any circumstance, we don't want that. And that'll get rid of about 20% of the chemicals. But for many chemicals, there's a trade-off. Sometimes they're gonna be moderately toxic, maybe, in, maybe even moderately uh, carcinogenic but it gets us on a way so we can talk about it. These are the endpoints. There's a little tool called QCAT, and I'm not gonna have time to talk about that, um, but that's an even simpler tool the state of Washington developed that's very helpful for, tool, for uh, companies. But in my opinion, these are the basic endpoints you always need to look at when making a decision. I love green screen. Uh, it doesn't look at global warming potential, for example, um, or ozone depletion. So for certain chemicals like propellants, we bring that in. And there is room for that if, if, um, if it's needed. So here's a way we often compare hazards. This is a whole bunch of green screens we put together. And here's the overall benchmark score. It helps companies make decisions when they're trying to figure out, hey, uh, which new water repellent ingredient do I want to go to? And, it, it's, uh, and we've got automated tools for it too. 
Oh, what's it like to generate? It's really fun. Um, it's not so bad, actually. And I've given you links. Uh, this is an automated tool. If you can type in a cast number or say a chemical name, then you can use this tool. Um, it's only $240 a year, or you can keep signing up with a new Gmail account and it's free forever. Um, and I can't say that. But um, these are the three major tools that are used in the US for hazard classification. And what's it like to be like me professionally? Um, it's a lot of work. And hopefully, as we train a lot more of you, as you get into, whether it's government, private sector, or your own companies, there'll be a bigger uh, cadre of people performing green screens. Um, one minute, woo, here we go. This is where you can find them. Uh, you're gonna hear Jen McPartland talk about a big report EDF just released, and there are, I think, 12 free green screens that, are, that uh, we uh, helped uh, prepare that are all free, and you can look at all the tools that are used. Another great tool businesses use is the US EPA skill, Safer Chemical Ingredients List. And what's new in toxics? If you do want to get involved and just see what is green screen, here are some links. Clean Production Action created green screen in 2007. They have great training. My staff and I are uh, instructors uh, for that, but you can take some webinars. Um, we've already heard of it from the Green Science P Policy Institute. Arlene asked me in a few of my talks to mention uh, their upcoming six classes webinars, so I suggest you do that. And then for businesses, there's no excuse not to join GC3 or BizNGO. It's amazing to look at the networking. You'll see like Britain snowboards being like, hey, what's up, Eastman? And normally a few years ago, they would not have been talking. And it's, it's, a, it's a nice place to be where people can feel comfortable. If you're a student, offer to volunteer to get there for free. I've seen people get jobs that way. Um, and they also have scholarships. The next meeting's in Kingsport, Tennessee for uh, GC3 at Eastman, so not necessarily Bahamas, but a nice place to be. <laughs> and then BizNGO is upcoming in Boston in December. Ooh, it's still cold, but good seafood. Um, <laughs> try, and, uh, try and go there. But as I teach companies around the world, and these are the design principles for sustainable and green chemistry and engineering, the goal is to get to safer and sustainable. So my part, hazard, is just one part of the sustainability matrix. I argue, though, it's still the most important part because we obviously want to live in a world where sustainability is paramount. But if you're a worker and you're sitting there with high chemical exposure, you need to minimize those hazards. So if you have any questions, I'm always available. This is my direct number and my email, and um, I'm happy to you know, network with you or answer any questions in the future. Thanks.